Um, let's go, on, go ahead and go on the record. We are on the record. So today um, we will kick in with H-492, which is establishing a homeless bill of rights. Um, and I invited in, uh, we invited in some uh, representative from the chamber, Lake Champlain Chamber, from the Vermont Lisa Cities and Towns, and from Legal Aid. So let's get right to it. Austin, please. Good afternoon, everybody. After a beautiful snowy afternoon as it is. Almost quick. So It'll be there. I'll be quick because I know folks want to definitely get on the road sooner rather than later. Um, for the record, Austin Davis, Government Affairs Manager with the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to engage with you on this important topic. And thank you for your continued work in this area. The Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce shares your concerns about homelessness and housing insecurity in our state. As the state's largest chamber and being situated in the largest metro area of, in the state, which has been grappling with homelessness, we understand these conversations can present a difficult, difficult balance to strike. This summer, LCRCC actually explored replicating programs such as those seen in Albuquerque and Denver and aimed at creating flexible work arrangements to uh, lower barriers for those experiencing homelessness to a type of employment that could serve as a, a new hub for uh, services to that uh, element of our community. Um, so uh, with things like this, like in terms of referring services, uh, um, creating community connections with individuals and uh, providing a, uh, a more collaborative uh, way to interact with uh, members of local government. Uh, we're actually tracking a pilot program uh, that was in Brattleboro called Work Today, which acquired some uh, grant funding, however, was not able to become operational due to an uh, inability to staff it. Um, so we're really interested in, uh, I understand that they are potentially going to be use that grant funding in the coming spring and hopefully hire a staff person for that program um, and see how that pilot works and potentially see if it's something that can be replicated in the Lake Champlain region or, and uh, potentially statewide. Um, so we come to you with a lot of questions about, uh, to better understand the intent of this proposed legislation. Um, Title I of the Vermont State Statutes doesn't currently contain a a any Bill of Rights um, for any other protected classes. And typically, uh, we've seen protected classes as something that's uh, non-temporal and embedded into a person's identity, not demographic. So we were wondering if this proposal does anything to mobilize or unlock additional uh, resources to assist homeless populations, what those might be. Um, we were wondering if this proposal uh, would, what this proposal would have for an interaction um, uh, with owners of businesses dealing with things such as loitering or behaviors that make it more difficult to operate a business in, in front of their sidewalk, for example. Um, and if the goals of this legislation are uh, already, we weren't sure if the goals of this legislation are already completed in other parts of statute. Um, again, we have tons of time to vet this popular current proposal, and so we just kind of have more questions than anything. Um, yeah. We're also concerned that legislation might have a detrimental impact on perceptions of an already uh, marginalized population. You know, we know that there's a level of stigma and misconception that prevents people from meaningful interaction with this population. Um, and we sometimes are concerned that with this added layer that folks might be uh, even more concerned that their interaction, whether, whether it is or not, could be construed the wrong way as discriminatory. Um, so we're, you know, partners here to better uh, educate uh, populations on, on what the intent is. Um, we're also interested in looking at uh, existing tools and the usage of them, um, such as the Workforce Opportunity Tax Credits, which are federally, federal credits aimed at encouraging the hiring of target groups, including um, and not limited to homeless uh, individuals, uh, individuals facing housing, um, challenges in homeless veterans. Um, so, in short, um, we're you know interested in learning more about this proposal. And as always, we'd like to be considered as a resource and a partner in crafting legislation. 
um, were interested in a siphon this le legislation, um, investigating with you and uh, working to look at programs such as the Work Today program um, and uh, current usage on ways we might increase existing tools such as the Workforce Opportunity Tax Credit. Um, with that, we'll take questions and engage in the conversation. So do you want some answers to some of those questions, or? Yeah, or just... I, I, I apologize for not being able to be here uh, when you walked through at Legislative Council. Um, and I mean, I, I maybe what I could do is, is forward questions I get along on this to someone on the committee, or um, I can just kind of try to summarize them. Um, but you know, folks are wondering, you know, does this, how does this affect, for example, if there are individuals outside of their business that are affecting, you know, their business during hours of operation? Um, does this make it more difficult for those folks? If you uh, are have a public establishment and somebody decides to sleep in that establishment, which kind of interferes with how you do business, um, under this, would that now be a protected, uh, you know, activity? Um, so, okay, so, so very quickly, I would suggest um, on this on that particular question, I would suggest um, finding our uh, getting a recording of the testimony from Bo Yang. Um, from a week or so ago, uh, and from Julio Thompson um, from from the Attorney General's office, they discussed. You know, the, 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 I think it's fair to say that this this does not prevent that from store owners f from enforcing you know certain behavioral based issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that any that they would remove somebody for at any rate, you know, this is, you know, this isn't about a demographic. This is about people, and this is about erasing the stigma that that comes along with it, and, and providing certain um, protections when. So so if a if a store owner says you can't come in because you're homeless, this they're like, well, I can be here because I'm just. I'm here to do something, but if they're here, if they're, if the objection is otherwise, or there's other reasons to do it, so I, I think that's just a round way to. I would suggest just going back yeah. to some of the testimony that is on record. Um, but, yes. first, but first, I want to actually, I just want to thank you, the, the chamber, for you know looking at some of these other programs and some of these other ideas of trying to help this situation. I mean, I think that's been clear. The chamber's been pretty clear about that over the years, that this is a focus um, and that they are aware and sympathetic towards towards the fact that there are people who are unhoused or some people that are um, but it, that are that are suffering through some home, some periods of homelessness. Um, but this is this is not to I think this this legislation is is not to um, excuse behavior in the public sphere. So I guess my question would be, are there people refusing service due to a person being homeless? Sure. You know, there's reports of that that are, and it, it's not, and we're clear that, that those situations are not associated with behavior that some people associate with being homeless, or is it, is it just the fact that the person is homeless? Um, and so I, I guess putting on the hat of, of folks who um, you know, come to me with questions, they're interested in understanding that like, in this case, um, you know, other protected classes, that's something that, uh, I guess I'm not formulating the question very well. <laughs> um, I guess there's just some confusion as to if this extends to um, things that a person might need to do in your establishment if they cannot find a place, any, another place to, say, sleep. If that person decides, I want to sleep in your establishment, if because that is a part of their protected, it is, it is a um, crucial component, uh, not crucial component, but something that is by virtue of their protected status, does that protection then extend to it, is the question. Um, I mean, my interpretation of this is that is simply that if in the course of, of a normal course of business, if, if it is interrupting a normal course of business, 
you know, again, it, it falls to the behavior of the individuals. It doesn't, it doesn't give carte blanche to people to say, oh, I'm homeless, I can go sleep anywhere I want because I'm homeless. It doesn't, it doesn't confer that right upon, upon them. It doesn't take the right away of an individual business to, um, to run the business in the, in the normal course of, of their business. It doesn't take that right away at all. John? I think Boryang actually helped me, anyway, parse some of this out. And uh, both seeing some of the other witnesses, it's not just homeless. It's perception of homelessness as well. Mm -hmm. that it, and so it's not, it, it's like if Brenda and I were sitting in a restaurant and he was well dressed, he had his meal, and he lingered, and I was disheveled um, and could be perceived as homeless, and I was lingering after my meal as well. That the, if the restaurant was urging everyone after they're finished to leave, with their meal, so they would go up to random and say, thank you, sir, and you might need to move the table. That would not be discriminatory to ask me. But if I was singled out with being homeless or perception of homeless, that would be discriminating. Then. So it's the due course of business. And the other issue that it is, and it was made clear for all of us, because we were asking this, I think, you and I were asking this, about if people are in front of, a, of business, uh, that it, it, that's an access issue, and so it is the business is right to say you can't block mm -hmm. entrance. So, but it doesn't say someone cannot sleep on the sidewalk mm -hmm. in front of the business if the business is closed. But when the business is open for business, then it's in the course of business that rightfully you would ask anyone to, not just. Well, I have to say, I find it kind of sad that we have to defend anyone's right to sleep outside in front of a business. I would hope that we could find the resources of the community to, to not have people sleep outside. Um, but I guess that's a whole other whole other conversation. So, yes. You know, my understanding of all of these various conversations that happened basically was whatever laws that are on the books that exist now in terms of behavior and that sort of thing mm -hmm. would still hold. It would be, as John said, in terms of service treatment or anything like that. That that's when mm -hmm. this kind of comes into play in terms of uh, just assuring people that it it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. The treatment that you get should be the same as anyone. So in that respect, equal treatment. Um, but again, as far as any, I'll call them vagrancy laws, I don't know what they're, what, or any, any laws that are on the books now that apply to behavior, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're misbehaving in some way, then y your behavior is going to be addressed, regardless of whether you're homeless or not. As to the question as whether it would unlock any funding, no. That's not the purpose of that, that's not the purpose of this. This is this is to again to um, basically make a statement that these uh, that individuals who are in these circumstances should be able to um, live their lives with the humanity and dignity that everyone else is expects to have, and that their belongings in particular or what have you can be that they have privacy concerns just like everybody else. Um, but that's really, that's the, um, you know, and, and then, then they're protected through, you know, ed, through what um, housing, public accommodations, um, that their housing status can't be used as a, as a barrier to housing? As well, as a, as a piece of discrimination. Yeah, they can't be discriminated against simply because they're, of their housing status. So I, I mean, I, again, I would, I, I would, um, I guess, ask you to go ahead and request the, the um, yeah, be whether it's written or whether it's on tape, just to hear, because I, I can't yeah. explain it with the eloquence that Bo Yang or with that Julio Thompson, in, in a more legalistic way, explained what this um, bill would do. So, but I appreciate you sharing and you know, and, and participating and wanting to continue the conversation. 
Yeah, thank you. I answered you know questions and great facilitated conversation. Um, certainly take some of this and share with members that have concerns and uh, try to engage with you folks. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Um, for the record, my name is Karen Horn. I represent the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, and I'm also here to uh, testify regarding H-492. Um, our understanding is that the bill would add housing status to the list of protected classes with respect to accommodation, housing, and employment. Um, municipal officials, I'm sure as you know, across the state are familiar with this tragedy of homelessness and with the many causes for it. I can't think of a downtown that doesn't support assistance to victims of homelessness with both the government and nonprofit providers that are out there um, working on these issues. And at the same time, every municipality with a downtown also works to balance the needs of a homeless population with efforts to grow a vibrant place-based economy that is attractive to the general public. Um, we are concerned, as was mentioned earlier, um, why this particular legislation would be put into Title I. Title I talks about common law, it talks about the open meeting law, the public records law, and um, access to interpreters for persons who are dealing with, um, who are deaf or hard of hearing. It doesn't actually talk about any of these kinds of issues. Uh, the draft language would guarantee a person without housing the right to use and move freely in public spaces, including sidewalks, parks, transportation, and buildings, in the same manner as any other person and without discrimination on the basis of his or her housing status. Um, and all that uh, works for us, makes a lot of sense. Uh, at page, on page four, it, talk, it says that no person shall be subject to civil or criminal sanctions for soliciting, sharing, accepting, or offering food, water, money, or other donations in public places. So really, the concern for municipalities is the language regarding the act of soliciting or panhandling, and especially um, aggressive panhandling, and I think that's some of the issues that um, that Austin may have been referring to in the in the in his testimony. It's not the status of homelessness. Um, and I have to say that in many instances nobody knows what somebody's housing status is. That's not problematic for municipalities. But municipalities do need to retain authority to adopt ordinances that address time, place, and manner of soliciting that are content neutral and do not burden people's abilities to exercise their free speech rights. Um, the law about soliciting or panhandling remains unsettled. Uh, we've read a number of articles um, with respect to this legislation um, and also two years ago when we testified on similar legislation that does talk about um, any regulations um, around soliciting in public places need to be neutral in content, narrowly tailored, leave open all ample alternative channels of communication, and serve a significant government interest that is pressing and legitimate. So we would ask you to assure that um, municipalities retain that flexibility if you adopt this legislation. We're also concerned about the language at the end of the bill, I believe it's at the end of the bill, or on page four of the bill, that allows a person aggrieved to bring action for appropriate relief in superior court, including damages, costs, and attorney's fees. Um, I think the first question is, who is an aggrieved person going to sue? And what is aggrieved? 
um, I think that those that needs to be defined a little bit better. And you may need to define, if you decide to go ahead with this bill, define soliciting a little bit better. That term is not to be defined here. <coughs> I'm happy to take questions. And I will send you a copy of this testimony and the um, reference to at least one of these articles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, yeah. we're gonna, you know, as, we, yeah. as we do move forward with this and you know, when we start work through, we'll, we'll have yeah. these questions yeah. put forward. And um, also to Austin's point, I mean, clearly the resources are inadequate right now to address homelessness in, in Vermont, but also right straight across the country. So, um, and municipalities, uh, you know, the, where it's visible is on Main Street in your municipal, in your downtowns. Representative Byron. Um, so it's my understanding that some municipalities around the state have done sort of like homeless sanctuary city statuses. Brattleboro mentioned in Middlebury. Yeah, uh, we're, we're developing quite a litany of sanctuary statuses on various topics. Yeah, no, 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 totally. <laughs> and I was just curious if, if you had received any feedback from those municipalities on how that stance has played out for them, good, bad, um, or I haven't with respect to that particular language. I do know that a number of our downtowns are really struggling with right now with how to adequately address the whole homelessness issue. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some, some people, are, there's a whole variety of reasons that somebody might be homeless, and a lot of them have to do with mental health, and, and that um, manifests, you know, on Main Street also. Mm -hmm. Brattleboro, you may have read an article a couple weeks ago about Brattleboro, they, could, they have a significant problem they're trying to solve down there. So how are they approaching it? They, they, I mean, that is a very innovative municipality, I have to say. But they, um, they, they, they're taking a, a number of different approaches. They've actually put out porta potties, and um, they're looking at the self-cleaning facilities. You know, they, um, they've done a number of things there to um, try and give people places to go and to be um, maintain their dignity and um, and uh, not just to the bathroom but to go to rest and sleep and <laughs> those mm -hmm. kinds of things um, and uh, they they have a transient population that comes through there close to the Massachusetts border so I mean I would suggest that you read some of those articles I can send them to you yeah, about course. what they've been dealing with recently Yeah, I want to follow up to my yeah. Yeah. Um, So while we're on the municipal topic, um, so that's sort of like the direct governance question, but about um, law enforcement engagement, mm -hmm. if a rule like this is put in place, do they change how they're engaging? Um, I don't know that I can really answer that question okay, very that's well. That's I fair. think that um, I think that it might. I, I don't know the the two components that um, sort of jumped out at me. One is certainly the language around soliciting and what is soliciting and what is aggressive soliciting and are we going to have the authority to sort of um, to address that by ordinance as if a town chose to because I, I think a number of towns wouldn't. But um, another uh, on page Three, you talk about a reasonable expectation of privacy in his or her personal property. And I don't know, this is a question, but there have been um, occasions when um, police have uh, asked people to leave um, parks and things, like City Hall Park. And so what happens with personal belongings there? That's been an issue off and on in um, Burlington, at least. I don't know what the answer is okay. to that question. Any further 
questions? Thank you for sharing. And we will, uh, if you can make sure we have um, your comments so that when, again, so that when yeah. we do work on this, we can ask the questions, um, discuss them, and you know, ask the attorney why Title I, um, right. and find out if that's the right place for it, and then move on from there. But we'll be, you know, we, we may not be marking this up for another week or so, but. Yeah, and when you look at the other, actually the language is in the um, bill, but when you look at the other sections that refer to protected classes, they're kind of scattered through the statute. They're not all collected in. Well, no, they're all scattered in all the different, the, in the housing sections. Right, the, yeah. right. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Karen. Thank, thank you. Wendy. Good afternoon. Thank you. So I'm Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid, and um, obviously I'm here to talk about the Homeless Bill of Rights. And first off, I need to say that I am not an expert in this area. I don't represent the homeless personally. Vermont Legal Aid does, and Legal Services Vermont provides um, uh, advice and sometimes limited representation. Um, so we handle a lot of cases between the two agencies. We handle a lot of cases of people who are homeless or at risk of homeless, but we don't have good stats for you on that because we don't collect them in that way. For example, I think arguably everybody that we represent in the Red Despro clinics is at risk of homelessness because if they're kicked out of their, where they're living now and they don't have their um, the money to pay for a new house, new housing, then they're going to be homeless. So I'm sorry I can't sort of tell you the order of magnitude of the cases that we have, but it is definitely something that our attorneys and the attorneys on the hotline at Legal Services Vermont have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, and because I'm not, uh, don't per haven't personally represented these people, what I would like to do with your permission is to read a couple of case examples from Jessica Radboard, who testified here two years ago when this bill was here, because they're case specific, and I think they maybe address some of the questions that you've raised already. So Jess writes, um, people experiencing homelessness are regularly specifically targeted for harassment and discrimination, violating their fundamental rights and making it even harder for them to obtain permanent housing. Please allow me to share a couple of case examples. Just a few months ago, and this was written in January of 2018, I was working with a client whose rental home was sold and her tenancy lawfully terminated. Tenants do not always get the kind of notice that they need to when they have to move, even if they've done nothing wrong. They get 30 days or 60 days, depending upon the length of the tenancy. In this case, my client simply did not find a new home in that time frame. She, had she remained in her home, in spite of the lawful termination, she would have been subject to eviction, caused significant economic damage to her landlord, and put her Section 8 voucher rental assistance at risk. So she left and she was placed in emergency shelter through the Department of Children and Families General Assistance Program. I reached out to the landlord to ask her to expedite review of my clients, this was a new landlord, of my client's application because of her desperate need for housing, only to be asked, what did she do to end, her, uh, to end up at Harbor Place? This question reflects a prejudicial view that a person experiencing homelessness must have done something wrong and must be unworthy, and it must be an unworthy rental application. A landlord may lawfully reject a homeless applicant because she has a negative rental history or caused damage to an apartment, but homelessness alone should not be a permissible basis to exclude a person from housing. Allow me to share another story that shows how the criminalization of homelessness can affect housing. Over the course of four years of homelessness, our client was arrested 17 times, 14 of which were dismissed by the state or the court, often without a finding of probable cause. Many of the arrests were based on our client's presence in a particular area of the city. A no trespass order had been issued by the police that barred our client from an entire municipal fire district, rather than a particular private property, including the central downtown area. So just by walking from one appointment to another, or even taking the bus, he could find himself trespassing and subject to arrest. These arrests and interactions with the police were profoundly traumatic 
for the client, and he felt that he had been labeled a criminal simply for existing in space. Later, when the client applied for permanent supportive housing, his application was denied because of his, quote, numerous arrests and contacts with the police, close quote, which the housing provider determined to make him too high risk for their program. Thankfully, with legal assistance, he was able to get that decision reversed and get into a safe house, home, with appropriate assistance. He was able to get that decision, I'm sorry, with appropriate services. A homeless bill of rights that bars criminalization based on homelessness would prevent arrests such as the ones experienced by this client and thereby free them from yet another barrier to obtain permanent housing. So I have a few statistics that might be helpful to your consideration. According to the 2019 State of Working Vermont report, more than 66,000 Vermonters lived below the federal poverty level last year. In 2017, our point in time count of people in shelters and on the street was over 1,200 people, an increase over the pre previous year. Looking to the Agency of Education's data, which includes doubled up families in its definition of homelessness, and that's the same definition as you have in H-492, we see that in 2017, 1,093 Vermont school children experienced homelessness. Homelessness and poverty are on the rise, making a homeless bill of rights an imperative at this time. Aside from the human cost, the longer a family remains homeless, the higher the cost to our state through our schools, economic services, the Office of Economic Opportunity, and so forth. We should be doing everything we can to protect homeless persons from discrimination and criminalization that creates barriers to their ability to obtain stable housing. So Vermont Legal Aid supports the Homeless Bill of Rights, and we <coughs> um, encourage you to adopt in its current form or a modified form, um, H-492. <laughs> um, could you repeat what you said about doubled up families from the ALE? I think that that is if you have one family with, living with mm -hmm. another family, one of them is considered homeless. Even if it's just a temporary situation in between homes? Do no, you know? I don't know. And Earhart may be able to answer that question for you. I apologize, but I no, don't know. No worries. All right. Sure. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's um, call it a day on this one right now. Um, so I, I would just ask, in the next week or so, we're going to be doing some markup on a couple of these bills. Um, recovery housing and um, perhaps on this bill so just if you can be as prepared as possible next week look at what we've look what's on our website under these bills read the material that's the back of material that's been provided um, and you know we're going to sharpen the pencils and get to work on it on a couple bills starting next week. Um, I doubt I'll see many of you. I, I suspect I, I won't see many of you tomorrow. So, um, yeah. So we have we have this bill, on recovery residency, and this bill on Tuesday um, and Wednesday, and then we're going to start more testimony. We're going to have more testimony on the rental housing health and safety bill. Um, we'll return to the uh, resolution JRH 7, apologizing um, for, for sterilization. Um, and that will be some markup with Michael Chernick. And then, um, again, with recovery residents and, um, and the Bill of Rights. And that takes us really through the end of the week where we will take up S83, which we heard a little bit last year on, um, which is prohibiting agreements that prevent an employee from working for the employer following settlement of a discrimination claim. We heard a little bit of testimony on that last year. That's the dark and the so-called dark in my door um, testimony, our bill. Um, so we'll be picking that up. So if, I see, if you come in tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow. If not, then have a good weekend.